Are you working basically at the BC Rich factory and like right before you join Megadeth? Um, yeah, it was, that's, um, I quit because of the band. I joined the band. Okay. It looked like they cut the Last Rites demo, which you weren't a part of, but that was early 84. And then do you know when Gar joined the band? Yeah, right after that, Gar joined the band. And that's when I saw them play at the uh, Waters Club in San Pedro out here. Gar said I should come down, see, you know, check out the band. And, it, you know, it was good, but, you know, it was three-piece and Megadeth, they weren't, you know, that band wasn't meant to be a three-piece. So um, Gar told me they were rehearsing at Mars, studio, you know, rehearsal studios, and told me I should rent a room. And that's how I got in the band. I brought my gear down and played really loud for, like, hours. And then they came, and I got asked into the band. Before your time, is that when Kerry King was playing with them some? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He would, um, I don't think he was in the band. I think he was just like filling in until Dave could find somebody. What was your impression of Dave's playing when you first heard him? Um, I don't know. You know, it's like, you know, there's a lot of drinking going on. And, you know, I, I just thought, you know, well, I mean, you know, the songs were awesome. And Dave had his, he knew it was Dave when he played. So it just wasn't the tone I would have chosen. And, you know, and as time went on, and Jesus, when he made uh, Rust in Peace, that's when he he really got his, I thought, really started to get his guitar tone like dialed in. Yeah, to me, that was kind of the peak. Although Peace is my favorite album. Just... Yeah, no, the, his playing on Peace Cells is like, it's got that, uh, that like Jimmy Page stagger, but it's still like you know dead on, and that's 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 what was cool is because we were told it was kind of like you know we were different guitar players, and I think that's what made it hard left, hard right, two different guitars that sounded different and were played different is why it gave it a that character. And just to confirm, I, I'm sure I already know the answer, but you guys both played the rhythm tracks, correct? On Peace Cells, yeah. So Dave cut all rhythm tracks on Killing Is My Business? 99% of them, yeah. There was a big buzz when that record got released. So when we did Peace Cells, Peace Cells was really, the reason that record sounded so good is because we did so many tours before we went in to play to record the record that um we knew what worked live and and we came in we went right into the studio coming off the road so we were really like ready to make that record and um we did it in 30 days man and you guys were playing uh songs right from peace cells on the killing tour yeah you, yeah, yeah before the yeah absolutely before the record even came out we were playing them live do you recall which ones specifically? Um, probably Wake Up Dead and Peace Cells and, you know, a lot of the, the good ones. I mean, I can't remember. I know we did a lot of those songs, and we did a lot of the songs from uh, the first record, too. The first record was hard, man. That rhythm, those rhythm parts were hard to play, man. Even the rhythm parts on Peace Cells weren't easy. I mean, that's why, you know, Gar told me this band is really challenging, and, and you won't get bored, trust me. Was that your first kind of um, studio experience, or had you had much before Killing? Um, you know, I'd been in the studio, but I never made a, a record for a, a record company. Being in the studio for me is fun because you, you know, you get an idea and you can put it down, and if you don't, if, if it doesn't work, you just erase it. <laughs> it's like so you can try stuff and and you know experiment. Indigo Ranch was where you recorded it. Yeah. What do you remember about that studio? Do you recall, like, the console, what kind of console they had? Oh, God. Uh, I think it might have been a Trident. Uh, it was probably a, an ADB or, or, or not. You know, it could have been an MCI for all I know. I don't remember. I, I didn't wasn't thinking about stuff like that then. The album is done incredibly quick, right? Oh, yeah. I think that record took two weeks or something. It said a budget of $8,000, but then half was spent on drugs and booze. You know what? I don't know because I didn't handle the money. But, um, I mean, Carrick Shea produced it, so he would be able to talk to him. He would know more about it. I know the studio got paid, and I think if that was 6000 So if we got 8000 the other 2000 was for, you know, gas, food, and whatever else. But that wasn't an easy place to get to either, man. Jesus, you had to drive up. You almost needed a, an off-road vehicle to get there. 
but it was really cool. It was out there. There were bungalows in the back. We slept there and um, there's a kitchen. We just never really left. But it, but there was, you know, it definitely wasn't enough time to make a record. They could have given us like 12 grand or something just to like, so we could like actually have time to fucking get the guitar sounds. There wasn't a lot of thoughts. It's like, get the parts, get the drums right, put the guitars on, get those right. And Dave Ellison was always super fast cutting bass. So that wasn't, that took no time. And then I, the only reason I did solos at all was because, um, one of the guys from uh, Relativity was telling Dave, you got to let this guy do solos. And so um, that's when Dave gave me more solos on that record. I always forget his name, and I, I feel terrible because he was a really great guy, and he was super good friends with Holdsworth. And he brought a, a Sundowner 100-watt uh, combo for me to do solos through that, that had just came out that Holdsworth was raving about. And... Um, I think I used it on a couple of solos too, but I think normally I was just playing through uh, Dave. I don't know where Dave got them, but he had a bunch of really good uh, non-master volume Marshalls that just sounded killer. And I, you know, and back then we weren't like going, "Hey, are the tubes? Is this thing biased? Uh, are the tubes good?" Nobody even thought about that. Is that a setting to where you guys are pretty sober through the recording of it? Um, you know, I mean, the drugs that we were doing, it wasn't like, you know, we were like, it wasn't like that. It was like you would do it and then you'd be able to work all day. And nobody was like, you know, like falling down or drooling or anything. It was just something we did. I've interviewed Randy Burns probably about five or six times, I think. And um, we've done several of his records or talked about them. But uh, the very first one when I hit him up was uh, I wanted to do Peace Cells and he talked about his favorite kind of moment or favorite memory as is, is being to where everything was set up in the studio. And he looks at Casey and he's like, hey, where is everybody? And Casey's like, they're all in the bathroom shooting up. And uh, <laughs> he didn't really get it then, even though he tells me later, you know, he had like a speed habit during that time, you know, while he's making a lot of those records. But um, he goes, and then they came out of the bathroom and they just played amazing. And uh, I'm like, wow, that's that's kind of mind blowing that they just uh, came out and uh, recorded. And he's like, I think there's like a misconception about drugs and playing. He goes, there was no effect. Yeah, and I remember because uh, we were working sometimes 18 hour days. And when things started to get like slow about 11, maybe midnight, Randy would like, just, like you know, give us a little bump of, um, of meth and we would go to like four. But that didn't happen a lot. I remember that happening once or twice when we had to get stuff done to finish things. And I, and, and I never even knew when we were doing it until that, until he had some. And I didn't even know he had a habit. I just thought he thought, well, I'll get some meth and we'll work through the night. Right, but, um, which is kind of weird to have a meth habit for some of the guys. I mean, most guys were like on coke, it seemed like, at uh, in the industry. I guess... You know, no drugs are good. At, you know, and when you have a habit, it might work to do it for a while, and but eventually, the only thing that matters is your habit, and then nothing else matters. And then you know, you wind up either getting sober or dying. Which is truly remarkable because um, it's not often that people get on heroin and are able to kick the habit. Really, I've had well, heroin is a cinch to kick compared to meth. Meth especially because the problem with meth is your dopamine takes you like over a year for your dopamine to start functioning correctly in your body. So you don't feel joy. You don't feel happiness. You don't feel anything. You're just like, you're just an empty husk. That's why nobody can get out. And especially nowadays, I just, I, my boss just showed me a, a video of the meth that's got everybody homeless here in California. It, uh, it is so pure that you don't even know if you're doing too much. And by the time you figure it out, you're so strung out that you can't get off it. It's totally breaking bad in L.A. right now. The, meth, the, the way the meth is made now, if I could tell anybody listening, whatever you do, don't do that shit. You might not even ever come back from it. And it's like I see it happening all the time around here. So how did you end up getting into drugs, like even shooting up? How did you even get into that? Well... It got to the point where we were snorting it. The, the people that I would buy from would tell me, you know, you're wasting hundreds of dollars doing that. And I, we were running out of money. And one day I just thought, well, I'm going to see if I can do this. And I sat down and tried to do it and wound up 
figuring it out. And then, you know, the rest is history. But that's also prior to joining Megadeth, correct? Oh, no, I, I didn't start shooting up until I was in Megadeth. I thought you and Gar were kind of the experienced ones on that end, and then the other Dave and David were kind oh, of... Oh, no, yeah, no, we were doing heroin, but during that time when I was, like, working for those guys, because I was going out on the road and, and, like, helping them with equipment and uh, going to gigs and when they were a three-piece, um, that's when I started, you know, money was scarce, and I just figured it out. And then those guys, you know, when Gar told them, you don't want to do this, and they said, no, we want to do it. And Gar said, no, you don't. <laughs> they said, yes, we do. And that's how it happened. And that starts on killing? Somewhere in that time period, yes. Sometime, I think, before the recording. But no, those guys weren't strung out. They were just called uh, what, what people call chipper, chipping, when they just do it once in a while. Right, almost for fun, just getting fucked up and... And then able yeah, to... Yeah, like, they, they weren't... They, it wasn't a habit for them yet. It didn't right. become a habit until peace sells. We all learned our lesson. You know, it's like, Gar didn't make it out. And, um... He was never able to get off of it? Oh, no, he was off it. Okay. He, he just, you know, somewhere along the line... He actually died from... He said he died from nicotine poisoning, but I think it's because his liver was failing. That's from what, all the years. Oh yeah, that's what it said online. From all the what? From all the years of drinking and, right. and drugs. And you know, Gar was he wasn't the healthiest guy, but man, he no matter what, he sat behind that drum set and played his parts, no matter how sick he was. Sometimes we had to go on stage like seriously sick. You know, our pupils were as big as black dinner plates, man. <laughs> that's what happens when, when you're coming off heroin. Your pupils just become a big black dot. That's what I would think would be like insane to be on that during a tour because there's probably lots of moments where you run out. Yeah. Well, I had a formula for that. It's really sad that I'm going to tell you this, but in any, any major city, you go to First Central, First, you know, First, Second, Third Street, and Central Avenue, and that's usually the worst part of town in any major city. And so I would just take a cab there, and nine times out of ten, I would come back with something. But if I didn't, we'd have to time, you know, how much alcohol, at least I would. I would time it so that I would drink about 20 minutes, half hour before we started going on stage, just so I could function without being all feeling like death. Right. <laughs> no pun intended. 